Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci-Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today, we're here with Caitlin Casulli. Caitlin, what do you do? I'm a third-year PhD student in biosystems engineering. Um, I actually uh, got my master's here at MSU in 2016, but I started in food science. I went to NC State and graduated with a degree in food science in 2014. That's really cool. I'm a biomedical engineer. What is biosystems engineering? So the field of biosystems engineering is essentially um, applying modeling uh, to food, water, and energy systems. Uh, Specifically within that, I work with food systems. So I am in food safety engineering, where I uh, essentially take uh, mathematical modeling of pathogen inactivation processes and help processors figure out how long to heat foods to get uh, to safe levels of microbes. What does pathogen inactivation mean in the first place? Pathogen inactivation is just uh, whatever, well, it's, it's the die-off of microbes. Um, so pathogens are risks to hu- human health. Um, so the one I'm looking at right now is salmonella, and that one can cause symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting, cramps, fever, So we want to try and inactivate this pathogen, kill it off in the food, so that way it doesn't pose a public health risk. Are you able to inactivate it while the food is still able to be edible after? Correct, yeah. So most of the foods that you eat uh, do undergo some pathogen inactivation process. Uh, One of these that is uh, probably most well-known is canning. So in the canning process, you put this food into a can, you seal it up, and then you heat this can, and we can use uh, heat and mass, well, heat and heat transfer modeling to figure out how long to hold that can to achieve a certain level of uh, reduction of this microorganism. When you say reduction, that makes me think that there's still some of it left over. Is that why we have to heat up our food anyways after we take it out of the can to make sure it's all gone? No, uh, so in this case, it would be all gone. Um, We typically overshoot what we think would be the level of pathogen in the food. So when we look at, uh, say, like a five log reduction of something, that means we think the level is much lower. And when I say five log, that means uh, 99.999% reduction of the bacterial load of the food. It's typically much lower than that, what we see in the prevalence. So we, we tend to overshoot just to make sure there's that margin of safety. Something that I'm kind of confused about, though, is that cans are usually made of aluminum. So it's kind of contradictory in my mind that you'd want to heat an aluminum can that has food in it af- and then eat it after. Because isn't it bad to heat aluminum and other things that the can could have? Because like, what if the can can be like seeping into the food? Yeah, there have been some concerns about different uh, materials leaching into the food. So I think one one concern was with very high acid foods like canned tomatoes. Occasionally, consumers would report that there were off flavors or there was like, so they had to put a lining inside the can or else the metal would essentially degrade under the high acidity of the tomatoes. So there are different different things to look at, but as far as like metal leaching into a food that's not typically a high acid food, it's not really a major concern to consumers. You said that you study salmonella, and I may be ignorant in this topic, but isn't salmonella usually something that's like in eggs or like dairy and stuff like that? So I would imagine salmonella is not going through the heat shock with a can. How do you study salmonella? My project is specifically looking at salmonella contamination in peanuts and other nut products. Um, So during my master's degree, I was looking at pistachios and um, I did some work with almonds and flour. So the way the salmonella gets into these products is that all all of these things come from a field somewhere. And typically it'll be contaminated with uh, soil. Uh, There have been studies that show that salmonella can exist in soils for very long times. And during harvest, if there's any cross-contamination with the soil, I mean, I'm sure you've driven by uh, harvest before being in Michigan and seen the big clouds of soil that come up. So the soil gets onto the product or product gets onto the ground during the harvest, and that's where the salmonella can get in. But don't they wash the food after they harvest it? 
not usually with nuts or other dry products. So the idea is that we want to try and keep these products dry with uh, fresh produce or something. You can implement some cleaning step or some uh, solution that will help to remove some bacteria. But with nuts and other products, it's typically not much of a cleaning step unless uh, you do have a step where you want to remove the holes from some of these nuts. But uh, typically, it don't it'll just get the holes removed, it'll go through some other kind of mi minor cleaning steps, and then it'll go on to, to the roaster. So you roast the nuts. That makes me think a lot of like roasting chestnuts by an open fire since Christmas is somewhat getting nearby now. Is that what's leading the pathogen inactivation whenever you're studying these peanuts in the first place? Correct, yeah. So when we look at pathogen inactivation, there are a lot of uh, things in the roasting process as well as in the nut that can help to inactivate that pathogen. Uh, one of these things is temperature, so heating it up. Uh, the moisture of the nut, so the higher the, higher the moisture content, the better uh, salmonella inactivation or other pathogen inactivation you're going to get, as well as the, uh, the humidity of the surrounding air. So especially in almonds, there is a mandatory treatment to reduce pathogens. And one of those things that they say you can do if you don't want to apply a very severe heat treatment is you can actually add steam to this process. And that really enhances the killing power of the heat that you do apply. Is that because the steam is going to be moving at a, uh, at a larger velocity inside of the vapor and colliding with these pathogens to kill them? We don't fully understand the mechanism, but there is the the uh, heat transfer that occurs when you have the condensation on the surface. So especially at these high steam concentrations, your dew point goes up. So your nut surface temperature stays below the dew point for longer, so you have this condensation effect. Uh, the effect does exist well after that condensation period ends, so there, there might be some interaction with the steam with the surface still remaining after that. And I'm hoping that uh, my PhD is going to further elucidate some of those effects so we can figure out what's going on at the surface. And at what temperature do they roast the nuts at? Is it a temperature where the nuts would explode at? Like I've, uh, that, That's what I'm thinking of when I think of nuts going through a roaster. It depends on the nut. So almonds can be up to 121 Celsius, which I think is 250 Fahrenheit, I think is kind of the maximum range. Pistachios are a little bit below that. Peanuts are pretty much above that, 325, 350 Fahrenheit. So yeah, the temperatures are pretty high and there's really not a risk of them burning or, or exploding or anything because they've done the chemistry science to figure out what's going to be an optimal roast as far as taste uh, color, texture, and all those factors. All of this leads into my next question. This seems like it has to be a very controlled environment based off the humidity and the temperature. Do you look at the optimal temperature to inactivate the pathogen or is that already determined? So a processor typically looks at what range of conditions is going to give them the most optimal color, texture, and flavor for their process. And then when we come in and do the validation science, we want to work within those ranges but also figure out what is the lowest amount of energy that we can put into the system and still give you a safe product that still fits within your quality range. And you had mentioned that there are some components within the nuts that help inactivate these pathogens. Do you study any of those? I mostly look at moisture, um, but I have heard of some people saying that maybe there are some antioxidants in the nuts that help enhance this process especially when you're getting the color and flavor development, you do get some antioxidants developing out of that. So we, um, I am curious to know whether that does have an effect. It's a bit outside my research area right now, but it is something I'm considering for the future, collaborating with a chemist to look at that. Since salmonella is considered a bacteria, has there ever been a worry that that bacterium can grow resistant to the heat that it's being constantly applied to it? There have been some studies done that show if you ramp up the temperature a little bit slower, then the salmonella can actually become a bit more resistant and inactivate slower. Um, I think this is not really a genetic thing. I think it's just like in the moment, so it's not going to like make baby salmonellas that are going to be more resistant in the future. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we've looked at. Does, 
Uh, if the moisture gets changed slower, if the temperature gets changed slower, is that going to somehow enhance its uh, resistance to the heat? So then if that's the case, how are you 100% sure that after the peanuts go through the roaster that you've already gotten rid of all of your salmonella? We are never 100% sure of food safety, so, um, but we do use statistics to figure out what is the prevalence and concentration coming in. And then we usually send samples with a known amount of bacteria through this roaster and then see what the resulting bacteria is. And like I mentioned um, previously, we're looking for that 99.999% log reduction or bacterial reduction in these cases. And how do you quantify the amount of bacteria going in and out? It's a process that we take these bacteria and extract them into some buffer solution and then plate that out. So put, these, put this solution on some nutrient auger and it'll grow the colonies and then we can count those colonies physically. And so whenever they come out of the roaster, if there's no colonies, then you're basically good, right? We, we like to think that we're good, but I also like to see starting number, final number. So when we put the bacteria into this called the inoculation step initially, we want to inoculate it high enough so that we do have some bacteria coming out so we can be certain of what, what level we're seeing before and after and what we're achieving once it's in the process. And where do you do your research? Is it here on campus? I haven't heard of a roaster here on campus, or is there a factory somewhere in Lansing that you go to? We have a small uh, lab-scale oven here on campus, as well as um, a larger pilot scale. I don't really know how to uh, tell you sizes, but um, the work I'm doing, so the work I did with my master's was with those two ovens, but with my PhD, things are going to be a little bit more complicated because I want to actually do commercial-scale testing. So one of the things I'm going to be doing actually in a couple of weeks is I'm going to North Carolina to a commercial uh, collaborator, and they have a pilot scale roaster. It's got a tray that's uh, about a square foot, and I'm going to be roasting the peanuts in that, and that actually simulates one of their commercial scale roasters, and I'm hoping to be able to travel to Texas or Georgia next year to do some commercial scale trials. Well, it sounds like your research is really heating up. It is, yeah. <laughs> Are you going to these commercial facilities to implement a certain method that you have developed or something that's already developed? Some of these methods have already been developed. Uh, mostly what I'm going to be looking at is to analyze these methods in a different way. So looking at how to statistically uh, quantify the inactivation and how to um, figure out what the heat and mass transfer is at the surface of these products. Because the the temperature and the moisture is really what's important for the inactivation, so I want to be able to figure that out. With all that being said, you mentioned earlier that you work with models to come up with an understanding of how the pathogen inactivation occurs within these peanuts. How do you simulate that prior to running the experiment? Because I would imagine you must have some sort of idea of what the effect would be before the experiment actually occurs. And what model do you use? The models I'm using, so I'm looking at one computer program called Comsol, and that will actually allow me to put in some different heat transfer values, such as the thermal conductivity of the food, the specific heat of the food, and then look at how, you know, for example, if I were to put that food into an oven with an air temperature of, uh, say, 350 Fahrenheit, how would that food heat up? And Comsol can tell me that with all these inputs that I put in. It would be able to tell you how it's heating from like the outside in. So like if I'm making a casserole, if my casserole is going to burn on the edges, but be fine in the middle. Correct. Yeah. So it'll give you if it's uh, if it's a problem where the temperature is uh, conducting into the food, then yes, it'll give you different temperature profiles depending on what what time steps you have. And I remember that you mentioned that you look at moisture, too. How does moisture play effect into this? So Comsol is set up to do both uh, simultaneous heat and mass transfer. So if I know things about the mass transfer properties, I can plug that in, and it automatically would compute that for me as well. Since energy equals mass, whenever you think of Einstein's relativity equation, 
are you also just looking at really when you say mass transfer, are you really just saying you're looking at how much energy is being transferred into the system? So I'm looking at energy in terms of temperature, and then it's a, a coupled heat and mass transfer problem. So when that energy gets transferred in, the moisture wants to migrate out because, as we know, once moisture gets above a certain uh, temperature, it wants to evaporate off and uh, even potentially boil. So not exactly like Einstein, but what you're saying then is is that the energy that's being put in is driving the mass transfer Correct. out. Yes, yes. It's just like uh, evaporation. If you were to leave a cup of water in the sun, it would eventually all get driven off because of the energy of the sun coming in. That makes complete sense. So back to your commercial internships or visits, are you still going to be conducting work here at MSU? So all the work I'm doing is going to be off-site. Uh, just because we don't really have this specific capability to simulate those commercial scale systems. So when I say that I'm doing the pilot scale simulations and then looking at trying to scale it up to the commercial scale, we know those two things are going to be very different, but I want to try and approximate them as closely as possible. And using the same equipment from this company is going to help me do that because they've figured out what their uh, surface looks like that the nuts are sitting on, they know kind of the airflow dynamics, so it's going to be a little bit easier to try and translate some of that small-scale science to the big scale when it comes time. Are you basically comparing a small roaster to a much larger one and seeing if what you're studying with a small roaster is applicable to the large one? That's right, yeah, yeah. So we're looking at just uh, comparing the two. Well, that's interesting. Then with that being said, how does the lab roaster scaled up to that commercial roaster is it on a linear scale a quadratic scale what have you found that's uh that's one of the questions that i'm going to be looking at i haven't really figured out the answer yet um, one of the studies that i was involved in in the past has indicated that it's not really a linear relationship so if i were to uh, target a certain level of reduction i wouldn't see the same in both scales i would see a little, a little bit more in the bigger scale system than the small scale system. So that's that's actually a good thing because you want to see more reductions of bacteria in that big system than you do, uh, say, in a theoretical study in the lab. But one of the questions I'm hoping to answer is to not only figure out how it scales up, but figure out how the variability is in that system. So we know that we can pretty tightly control a lab scale or a pilot scale system. But when you get up to the commercial scale, we see that there are different zones within a roaster that might be hotter or colder, and all of that will impact the inactivation process. How does the surface area of a nut play into the role of, of pathogen inactivation? The surface area, I don't think, would have a huge impact looking at maybe heat and mass transfer dynamics, it might impact how much moisture comes out of that product. So if you have a very small nut, then you have more potential to draw out more moisture if you have like a bigger surface area to volume ratio. But if your surface area to volume ratio is much smaller, meaning you have more volume as compared to surface area, then you're going to be drawing out less moisture and that could somehow play a role in the dynamics of the inactivation. Yeah, because I just think about how you have these different sizes of nuts all the way down from the peanuts that you're studying to these massive, like, chestnuts that I was referring to earlier in this interview. Yeah, correct. So depending on how these things are processed, if there is potential for greater moisture to come out, then that'll go into the air and potentially... Um, also have a greater impact on the inactivation because the more moisture you have in the air, the uh, greater the potential is for the inactivation. Does the area that the nuts are harvested affect the amount of bacteria in the soil? It depends. So one of the things I was looking at, I did a risk assessment for peanuts, so essentially looking at kind of the supply chain, prevalence and concentration, and we were finding that the concentration in a certain crop year was a little bit dependent on the rainfall from the previous year. And that could just be that the rainfall in that previous year was moving around more salmonella. So that way when the crops for the following year were planted, 
there was more potential for that cross-contamination to happen. Well, I have to ask, since you are studying peanuts, do you happen to have a peanut allergy in the first place? I do not, fortunately. So I can go inside these facilities, I can st uh, study the peanuts, I can touch them, I can, you know, take a sample if I'm actually working in a food grade lab. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to do this project if I had a peanut allergy, and that would be highly unfortunate. <laughs> So then, besides exploring these peanut roasting facilities, what else do you like to do on your spare time? Uh, so I have a dog, a Boston Terrier Chihuahua mix, and he keeps me very busy. Um, I also enjoy home brewing, and I play ice hockey. So. Oh, so you make some of your own beer. I do, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, is there a particular style that you like? Um, I tend to like darker beers, so like porters and stouts. I don't think I've brewed any of those recently. I need to get back into brewing, um, but since winter is coming up, maybe a good porter or stout will be on the menu pretty soon. Do you ever involve the peanuts that are in your research in your home brews? I don't because uh, they're lab-grade peanuts, even though I'm using a surrogate for salmonella, so it is safe for consumption. I don't really want to risk the cross-contamination. But I, I've had peanut beers before, and they're pretty good. So It's really interesting that you mention your passion for brewing beer. Danny and I actually just went over to Sagatug Brewing Company with the Grid Bar Arcade, and we brewed our own beer for science. So it was really cool. It was the scientists working with other people brewing beer, and then later on people will be able to drink this beer while listening to scientists. So we'll have sci-filers like yourself talking about their research while people can drink beer that we brewed. That's pretty cool. I actually did a project during my undergraduate degree in food science. So in food science, we learn about a lot of the concepts beside, uh, behind brewing. So one of my projects was looking at uh, mashing. So taking the sugars out of the grain and converting them into sugars that can be digested by the yeast. So there's a lot of science and I, I find it very exciting and I'm, I'm glad to have a degree that helps me understand these processes. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you have that degree as well. Now I can go enjoy some nice, tasty craft beers whenever you brew some in the future for this upcoming winter. But thanks so much for coming on to our show this morning. We really do appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to have been invited to share my research story with you and with the listeners. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on Scifiles.